business case worries me. I really think there's a problem with that because the word business case uh, has connotations that I don't think are amenable to um, change uh, in the present mindset. The business case usually assumes it's a business case within the context of business that we understand. Um, let me ask the audience, who do you think the biggest camera manufacturer today is? You think Samsung? Sony? You think it might be Nikon? No, it's Nokia. It's Nokia, which is the biggest manufacturer of cameras. None of us think of that. But the point is, business cases have to be made into the unknown into all kinds of new assumptions that we don't even understand. Business cases of the type I was talking about earlier, decentralized systems rather than big monolithic refineries and factories. Uh, business cases about new kinds of markets and demand. Business cases about how to make money doing the right thing. So business cases not only can be, but have been made. And I myself, 30, uh, in 1971, I'm sorry, 1981, was a product, the first social enterprise in the world, which was a business case, but it was unheard of, supported by UNEP. Your predecessor actually um, allowed me to break out into a totally new business case. But how did businesses understand it? I didn't find a single business person who thought that it would, it would work. So business cases have to be taken in not quite the literal sense that um, our consultancy firms understand them today. Let me just very quickly say a word on vested interest. Yes, he is. Vested interests are not only the people who send lobbyists to the Senate and to the uh, Parliament and to talk to governments. Uh, vested interests are deep uh, intellectual commitments. Sometimes our vested interests are not meant to be seen as of private advantage to some particular group or individual. Vested interests are commitments that we really firmly believe are uh, of importance to society because of the past. So vested interests are much more subtle things than often we understand. Yes, of course, there are always lobbyists who are asking you to do things that will make them more profitable. But that's not what I was talking about. There are much deeper vested interests that we need to deal with. Thank you. Angelina, if the world is struggling to, in a sense, work through a legally binding agreement on something like climate change and, you know, whatever the scenarios may be for how we will conclude that collective policy setting, what else is going to drive the renewable energy revolution? Is it just the scope, the, how do you say, the, the scenario of scarcity, uh, risk, uh, energy security? I mean, America has been very good at articulating all sorts of rationales for moving towards renewable energy beyond <laughs> its original purpose, which is to maybe keep the world cleaner and uh, perhaps less polluted. What is it that in the marketplace you see at the moment in your domain that is, is the hottest driver of this discussion? I would like to go back to the point of where I said, what is the role of the UN as well? I happen to be a big fan of having centralized legislation and of having a benchmark, so to say. Even though countries are reluctant to give up their sovereignty, there needs to be a universal standard or a universal understanding, which we don't have right now. So the role of the UN could very well be setting those standards, setting those benchmarks, setting those best practices, giving those examples, working with industry hand in hand, because industry is global. Technological standards are becoming globalized and where industry locates and how they develop and how they behave depends on local standards as well. So the saying, think globally, act locally, is very relevant here. People are reluctant to be cutting edge all by themselves if they're not supported by long-term legislation. And I would like to say that whatever framework we put in place, whatever incentives we put in place, that they're long-term. So that the investment community can have some kind of a confidence that when they do invest in these technologies based on business cases for the future, that this is a secure investment as opposed to what we've seen many times in the past hurt the renewable energy industry, a short-term commitment that then is pulled away, the industry collapses we have numerous examples. And again, setting a level playing field. I hear people often say there's no such thing as level playing field. 
the only level, level playing field we have is the graveyard, so deal with it. Well, <laughs> you know. Well, we have to soon stop, otherwise we'll all be end up in, ending <laughs> up in the graveyard. So uh, last thought and then I'll pass to Adrian and then we'll have to wrap up. Yeah. My last thought is that we need to have a framework that is universal, that people can relate to, and to go to the question that I had from the audience specifically for microgrid. Microgrid is the future. It is what, if I were to envision whether we're in the United States, in Europe, in India, in the Maldives, anywhere in the world, there's going to be construction, there's going to be development, people are going to need to live somewhere, people are going to need to have energy, people are going to need to have transportation. So what I would see is smaller communities, powered by a microgrid, even if you do have um, centralized power stations, utility is becoming much more nimble in the technologies they incorporate. There's also another platform for the UN and for everybody to work together in terms of bringing different stakeholders, bringing the builders to build the zero energy house, bringing the solar panel manufacturers, bringing the inverter people together, bringing the smart grid communications that enable that grid to work much more efficiency, efficiently at 90% as opposed to the 40% that we have now. People getting into their electric vehicles or hybrid electric vehicles because we want them to go long distances and that also becomes the backup storage for the renewable energy system that is powering this community. And this is something that I think is very doable, that allows industry to thrive, that allows politicians to be able to set policies with a vision, and that allows everybody to have a much cleaner, greener lifestyle very much in our lifetime as opposed to our children's lifetime. And believe me, our kids will thank us for it. Thank you, Angelina. I have a very unfair last question to you and uh, three sentences. Uh, longer ones. <laughs> so how is in Mexico at the moment the thinking about how Cancun will recover the momentum but also take some of these lessons that we have touched on this morning on board? Do you think that uh, new crystal of uh, a way forward is forming already or there is still a very open arena? And in one minute if you can please. 